Hi, Dr. Dryams. Good morning. Ketrell, good morning. Great to see you. Okay, so I'm really looking forward to hearing about your experiences as, as a physician uh, treating, treating hospitalized patients during, during the COVID-19 epidemic. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Dr. Dryams is on the faculty at NYU uh, teaching medical residents, and he also cares for patients uh, at Bellevue and at, uh, at a VA hospital. And, uh, and without, without any identifying details, obviously, he's gonna share with us some of his experiences. So please, we're all ears, Dr. Dreams. Thanks, Ketriel. Yeah, it, it's been uh, an unbelievable year. And just to kind of, as, as an introduction, I remember really early on, I believe it was March 15th was the exact day. Um, you know, at that time it was before New York, before New York was on the lockdown. Um, but I think, I think that was March 30th. So it was a couple of weeks before that, but definitely um, the fact that COVID was increasing and causing a lot of illness and beginning to cause a lot of death, uh, you know, was, was around that time. And I remember coming in for, to work in the ER that Sunday. And um, when I walked in, you could feel the degree of fear. And it was a degree of fear in the patients and also in the staff there. People were confused about what was going on, what it meant. And I remember coming in through the medical ER entrance. And, you know, at that time, nobody was wearing masks on the street. Nobody was wearing masks in public places. But when I came into the hospital that day, I noticed that some of the staff members were wearing masks in areas that they didn't typically wear masks. And some people weren't wearing masks in those areas. It wasn't very easy to get any kind of masks randomly at that point. You know, now if you want to get a surgical mask, it's pretty easy. And even if you want to get an N95 mask, it's pretty easy. But at that time, you know, an N95 was kind of involved to get. And even a surgical mask, if you weren't working in a specific area, you'd have to kind of track it down. So I remember that just making a real impression on me as I walked in, like, huh, what, you know, what's the right thing to do under these circumstances? Um, and definitely when, when I, when I headed around the corner into the psychiatric uh, ER area, um, there was definitely that continued sense of kind of fear that was sort of in, in the background about what was going on. And, uh, you know, just trying to even test people at that point, I think was not really completely possible. And so we did what we could to screen people um, by taking their temperature and asking them about uh, sick contacts and symptoms but it was a scary time, a scary time for patients and it was a scary time um, to work there. But, you know, we, we were there, you know, we kind of put, put the fear aside um, and, you know, did our best to kind of focus on uh, taking care of the patients. So that was just kind of an, an introductory thing. And just one of my memories that I, that I wanted to share about the beginning of the crisis. Okay. Could you tell us a little bit about a, a patient who might've come in with, uh, with, with emotional difficulty and then and discovered in the, in the hospital that they were in fact positive or probably positive for, for COVID? Sure, yeah. Um, and unfortunately that happened a lot, that people would come in for another reason. They may have had other symptoms that they suspected or didn't suspect had to do with COVID, but their primary concern was that they, were, they had been feeling depressed or maybe even that they had made a suicide attempt um, or they were feeling terribly anxious and they needed some help. And after some time, we were able to start doing testing on everybody just so we knew. Um, and there were a lot of patients, particularly sort of in that second period of time where somebody would come in and then we would find out that they were COVID positive. And so in addition to, to already feeling depressed and distraught, um, they would be fearful about what this, what this, what this meant. Um, so I can remember one patient in particular who came in primarily for feeling very distraught and depressed um, and the degree of fear that it added uh, when he found out that he was COVID positive in terms of was this going to affect his lifespan? Uh, was he suddenly going to develop severe symptoms? And when, when would he be outside of that danger window? And what would he do when he left the hospital? Would he have to stay away from people? Uh, would he have to isolate? Um, so it was a, it was a, a scary experience uh, for him. Uh, fortunately, in his case, he did not have significant symptoms of COVID um, and he remained in the hospital for a sufficient number of days that by the time he left the hospital, he, wouldn't, he wasn't required to remain on quarantine. Um, but part of 
part of the treatment was providing him with reassurance and information um, about what the positive test meant, in addition to hearing about what had been going on in his life and it had led to his feeling depressed and offering him a treatment while he was there in the hospital. As you can imagine, it, uh, and I had, I had treated this patient before actually, um, and as you can imagine, you know, suiting up in a, uh, you know, a gown and uh, gloves and uh, an N95 mask and either goggles or a face shield, it's a little bit off-putting in that kind of a setting. You know, it's not, a, it's not really a, that the person isn't coming in for medical treatment, they're coming in for psychiatric treatment. And in fact, the patient, as I said, the patient knew me from before. So to see me in this unusual garb was somewhat off-putting. And so I would typically start off by introducing myself and letting them know that I can imagine that, um, you know, seeing me in this, in this, in this suit um, can be a bit upsetting. Um, and so we talked about that a little bit to, to begin with and then kind of went, went on from there. Okay, and, uh, and, and, and when, you, when you met patients who had COVID and, and, and another issue, uh, did you have any special tools to help them or, or approaches that, that might be interesting? In the hospital, providing information and reassurance was a key factor uh, because a lot of, because a lot of people wondered similar to this patient, you know, this isn't what I came in with, but shoot, what does this mean? Does it mean that I'm suddenly going to get sick next week? And so providing them information like, well, after a certain number of days, the likelihood that suddenly you're going to develop severe symptoms is very, very low. Um, and providing them with information on what it meant in terms of quarantine. So information was definitely a key intervention for people in the hospital that also had COVID. Um, in, in, in outpatients that I had treated who had COVID and came to me for reasons that were either directly or indirectly related to COVID, similarly, information was useful to them to let them know that because of inflammation that occurs following COVID or probably inflammation or probably some type of immune response, some symptoms can persist that can make underlying symptoms worse. Uh, for example, if somebody has ADHD, um, following COVID, those symptoms could potentially get worse because even for somebody that doesn't have ADHD, um, symptoms like that can come up. Um, so providing them with that information and uh, reassurance, sometimes referring them to infectious disease specialists, um, and also going over other kinds of interventions that they could do um, at home that may help with, for example, in that case, uh, concentration. In some cases, did having COVID open up an opportunity for, for patients to get more effective help? Or was that never the case? I th yes, I think that it, <clears throat> I think that it did. Um, Some of the patients in both settings, some of the patients that came to the hospital, uh, the fact that they were COVID positive and required such close observation and, and, and often isolation, and were basically always isolation in the hospital, I think brought to the forefront to them the need to maintain contact with treatment after leaving the hospital. Um, so, so that was one aspect of it. Um, and uh, to continue to care about their uh, physical and mental health, even outside of the setting of a crisis. Because some of the patients that came in, they weren't really getting regular outpatient treatment before they came to the hospital um, and sort of were in a crisis and then came to the hospital. And so I think that it underscored the need to be regular about you know, uh, treatment and, and maintenance of uh, physical and mental health. Um, in the outpatient setting, I think that it did bring a lot of people to treatment that may not have otherwise come to treatment. Um, you know, if, if, if COVID had not transiently made some symptoms worse, either directly or indirectly, they may have just tried to grin and bear it. But I think that knowing that COVID is a thing, that it's something that can affect other symptoms, hearing about it on the news, being aware of it, 
um, and feeling as if something needs to be done about it. It, it, it maybe brought some people in for psychiatric treatment that may have otherwise just, just tried to put up with it, basically. So, so there is a bit of a silver lining to, to go over for, for some people. Uh, yeah, I, I would say that there is a little bit of a silver lining. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I have, some, have some of these patients kept up with the outpatient care uh, over the last you know, few months or, or so as COVID is, has hopefully been, been declining. A lot of them have, and uh, one reason is because of what I mentioned before, that they just, it was kind of, uh, it was a bit of a scare, and so they thought, you know, I really need to keep up with this after I leave from the hospital, and they're generally doing better. <clears throat> and the other thing is that another silver lining with COVID is that it's made it more acceptable and common to conduct visits by video, um, <clears throat> you know, med some medical visits, but also psychiatric visits as well. And so for patients that um, may have missed appointments or just had trouble getting to the clinic or to the practice or to the hospital or, or whatever it was, now people can have visits at home. So I think that it, there is something that's lost in doing it in a video, definitely. And some people definitely prefer in person, but I think that by and large overall, most people have found it convenient and easier to make appointments when they can do it from wherever they are. So that was sort of a silver lining and is sort of a silver lining as well. Okay, as a, as a psychiatrist, who is not just a trained psychiatrist, but who trains other psychiatrists, did you ever imagine that you'd be, you'd be approaching, approaching people in, in, in serious emotional distress, wearing, wearing a face mask, shields, 95 mask, mask gloves, mm -hmm. gowns? Never, not at all. I, really not at all. And, you know, the N95 mask, everybody is fit for an N95 mask for protection from tuberculosis. And I remember thinking back to when I was a medical student and when I was a resident and I was getting fit for this mask. And basically, you know, the, this, you know, in my mind was going to be for an exceedingly rare situation where maybe if somebody had tuberculosis and they were on a medical ward and they were depressed, once in a while that kind of thing might come up but I hadn't used, I knew what it was, I was fitted for it, et cetera. But to think that I was gonna then be using this kind of protection on a regular basis, it was just, it just unimaginable, totally unimaginable, yeah. Do you think that working with all those layers separating you and the, and the patients has made you in some way more able to connect? Especially now that, you know, that as you meet people in person and you, and you don't have to wear as much the, the, the protective equipment. You know, that's, that's a good question, Kashreel. I, I think that it has, uh, because, you know, ha having to do it under such odd circumstances um, and to kind of, you know, adapt your, the, the way that you're engaging somebody in spite of having a, a literal physical barrier between you and them that doesn't typically, that doesn't under normal circumstances exist, really kind of it pushed me to figure out other other ways to to approach things and in, in terms of you know, body language, uh, gestures, tone of voice, and, 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 and other factors. So it, I think that it does. Yeah. And I think that that's, the, that's, that's a great point. Okay. So, so in terms of bottom line, the, the COVID has made some people more, more receptive to, to getting and sustaining treatment. And it may have made you and some of your colleagues possibly a, 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 even better at what you do. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I do think so. Okay. Uh, okay. In terms of social isolation for the people who came in, uh, who, who came into the hospital with, with, with symptoms of emotional distress and, 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 and they'd already been isolating for some time before they came in, right? Because everybody's isolating. Even if it wasn't the official isolation, they, they probably weren't going to work with other people. They weren't, uh, mm -hmm. they weren't going to visit the, you know, older parents, they weren't, they weren't going out to dining restaurants. Uh, did, did that aggravate some of their, some of their underlying conditions, do you think? It, it did, yeah. Um, you know, the, probably the most clear example of that is aggravating anxiety symptoms. Uh, that, you know, somebody may have already had a degree of social anxiety, a little anxious around meeting new people, worried about what people might think. But if the person is now in an environment where they're almost never encountering that kind of scenario, in the rare occasion that it does come up, it's going to provoke a greater degree of anxiety. 
Um, so I've definitely seen great increases in social anxiety and generalized anxiety and worry in the setting of being isolated. Definitely. Okay. I, I'm guessing that might continue even as, even as, as people tend to work more from home and work more remotely and have less opportunity for real human interaction. This, is, this may be kind of a long-term, a long-term difficulty to be addressed. It, it, it seems like it will be, yeah, exactly. With even if you know the the uh, the infectious issue uh, resolves or significantly declines, just working from home and not having the same frequency of social interaction will heighten the degree of anxiety that social interaction has for people that have an underlying anxiety condition. Absolutely, yeah. And can you can you talk about some of the ways that you might uh, when working with it, with a, with, a, with a patient? Some of the ways you might uh, you might help them work through some of that anxiety and reduce that le a level a level of anxiety. Sure, there, there would be different approaches of it. You know, I, I suppose the um, uh, yeah, there would be different approaches to it. One of them would be with using psychotherapy, and the psychotherapy may look at what exactly is being heightened. Is is it a perception that they? that they may be perceived in some negative way from the other person. Often that, you know, concern or perception is not something that's fully conscious. So keying into what it is exactly that's getting magnified, and often it's that fear that they're going to be perceived in a negative way, can be beneficial. Even looking at it in more detail in terms of what exactly is the negative way? Is it that you'll be perceived as incompetent? Is it that you'll be perceived as uh, uh, unlikable or, or odd or, some, or things along those lines? Is it something about your competence and capabilities? Is it something about your, your concerned about your psychological makeup or, or, or otherwise that you may be criticized? And so looking at that, bringing it into the conscious area often allows the person to have some more perspective on it so that although it may continue to come up, the effect that it may have is lessened. So that, that would be one approach to it through, through psychotherapy. Um, there would definitely be approaches that could be used with regards to medication. Um, there are definitely medications that are helpful for generalized anxiety and these kind of scenarios that can be used. Um, and, and, the, and the other idea would also be to sort of a exposure way of, of doing it that, um, of addressing these symptoms in that if the person is not, you know, uh, having social contact in the same way with regards to work, what other things could be introduced in the person's life to maintain m closer to normal social interactions on a regular basis so that these symptoms aren't exacerbated beyond their baseline uh, if the person is completely isolated. So th those are the three areas that come to mind. Okay. And you found that these, these non-medication approaches, psychotherapy, exposure, uh, are often effective? Definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, Dr. Trump. So it was great meeting you this morning, and uh, you know it's a pleasure to it's a, it's a pleasure to see you with your uh, with your Bellevue Bellevue ER badge too. We're uh, very proud to be to have met you this morning, and thank you. Yeah, thank you, Catrail. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Hi, Dr. Trump. It's good to see you again this morning. Good to see you again, Catrail. So, uh, so we'd like to hear from you a bit about your experiences with uh, with people who, who are struggling with substance abuse, and uh, and your encounters with them in the in the hospital emergency room uh, during the COVID nineteen pandemic. Sure. Yeah. Um, there there have been a lot of those kind of uh, scenarios, especially now that we can do widespread COVID testing, where somebody will come in very intoxicated. Uh, uh, in, a, in withdrawal from a, from a substance or, to do, or just coming in to detox from a regular use of a given substance. And since we're able to test everybody, uh, you know, there's a significant proportion of patients that will unknowingly be positive for COVID. And so they'll be admitted to a medical unit um, so that they can have the appropriate isolation precautions for the appropriate period of time. Um, so I, I have seen many of those cases, both in the emergency department and also on the wards. Okay, and, and how does that interplay of the COVID-19 and the substance abuse problem play out together? It, um, 
I can think of a couple of ways that that they that they interact with one another. One of them is that you know with with the substance abuse, often I've seen a great deal of sort of psychological or emotional isolation. Um, you know that the person is is doing these things, although maybe occasionally they may be using substances or drinking alcohol um, in the presence of other people. Really, in a way, it's sort of a, uh, an isolated activity. Um, and you know, in the setting of COVID, I think people are even more isolated. Um, so, I mean, I mean, not I think. I mean, they obviously are more isolated. Um, so, the combination of those two can lead to worsening reliance on substance to fulfill those kind of uh, empty or negative feelings related to not being able to or not having sufficient connections with other people. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect of how it how it may affect somebody is if somebody is positive for COVID and they're treated in the hospital, it definitely uh, presents a new array of challenges um, treating them in a setting that they may not be familiar with um, in, uh, in getting treatment for a substance abuse issue. Typically, somebody wouldn't be admitted to that type of a ward in an isolation setting for alcohol withdrawal, for example. Um, but, you know, currently, if, that, if the person is COVID positive, it, it, they, they would be. Is there an upside for, for a patient to have to, to, to be admitted to the hospital and then to be discovered COVID positive? In, in a way, there is. Um, one of the ways is that I think that it, it brings to the person's attention that while they're using, whether they're drinking alcohol, using other substances, while they're using, they're really not attending to their physical health. Um, and they weren't even aware that, you know, it, it, and, and often the, even the possibility that they could be COVID positive in, let's say, asymptomatic, doesn't really enter into the radar. And often what we see is when people, a little bit after they stop using substances, they then become, they then realize, geez, I haven't been attending to my physical health for quite some time. And I think having a COVID positive test really brings that to the forefront, you know, as a potential consequence of their substance use. Whoa, I'm, I mean, I could have all kinds of stuff going on with me. And when I'm using, I'm just, not aware of any of this, and it's just not important to me. Um, I really have to do something uh, to maintain my physical and mental health. So I think in that way, yes, it can be a positive catalyst for change. Hey, have you seen people post post hospitalization and after recovery from COVID who, who in fact have, have been following up outpatient and getting continuing care and support? Yeah, I, I have. and. In, in some ways, in, in particularly, yeah, in some ways that that's actually improved during COVID because of the accept uh, the acceptability and kind of the, the the fact that it's become more of a standard thing to conduct visits by telehealth. So now, if patients may have had difficulty making it to appointments or um, or that kind of thing, they can attend their appointment from wherever they are. If they're at home or even if they're somewhere else, they can still attend the appointment. So actually, in some ways, it's improved because of that increased accessibility. Okay, and in, ter in terms of people's isolation going forward, you know, we, we all hope that we're coming out of this, but it seems to be a slow process and possibly an uneven process. Uh, but, but more people work at home, more people, more people are remote. It, 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 people tend to have less of a social life. Do you see this as being a contributing factor or maybe a beneficial factor to, to, for, for people who have a substance abuse issue? You know, I remember thinking among other addiction psychiatrists that possibly because of the, the issues related to COVID that maybe people just, it would be, it would be a barrier to people really um, purchasing illicit substances, let's say, either directly or indirectly. And so that there may be a decline in substance use as a result of that, it just be more difficult to get um, illicit substances. Um, that totally has not been the case uh, based on interactions with patients, specifically asking patients about that, and also the, um, the amount of patients that we've seen in the emergency department related to consequences of substance use. So that's, that's one aspect of it. But the other aspect of it is that people that are at home and isolated at home, I have seen a lot of patients that have began drinking more as a way of um, initially maybe relaxing, blowing off some stress, and in lieu of typical social interactions that they would, that they would um, typically enjoy. And 
often patients know, you know, this probably isn't so great, but under the, you know, to be, to be drinking more, but under the circumstances, it may be something that they resort to. So in some ways it can make the situation worse. At the same time though, just like with the patients that were discharged from the hospital, seeking out treatment and being somewhat uncomfortable about seeking out treatment, I think is reduced or mitigated to some extent by the ability to receive treatment through video, through video visits, that somebody can go on the internet, they can find my website, they can schedule a consultation, and it's a little bit less anxiety provoking that they can do it in the comfort of their own home. So in that way, there may be a benefit. Okay, Dr. Shyam, that's good, and we're we're hoping to we're hoping that more people will seek out treatment. And, yeah, uh, same here. And I, I, I look for I look for I look for effective treatment. So it was really great talking to you this morning, and uh, and thank you. Thank you, Katrina. See you later.